Hello. Today in uh, community development, we're going to speak about the process of community development. We're going to specifically discuss and describe the 10 steps of community development, and these are uh, presented in a chapter you read by Brown and Harris earlier in the term. So we'll be going through these. All of these really revolve, all the steps revolve around relationship building, which you can see is at the core of the process. And each step in this model is really closely connected to the one before it, as well as the one after it. And we, I'm presenting this as a series of steps, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a linear process. You might be kind of moving back and forth between all of these. This is the model that was presented uh, in chapter six of Brown and Harris, but there's lots of other types of models, but most of them do have the same essential steps. In this lecture, I'm going to use my example of uh, my community development work at specifically the Rabbit Town Community Garden. So I've mentioned to you before that um, well, my uh, volunteering with the Community Garden Alliance is very uh, closely connected to this course, uh, as well as, you know, kind of my environmental ethic. So when I first arrived to St. John's, um, I signed up for a community uh, sharing um, organization, you know, where you support a farmer ahead of time, you prepay for your food, and then each week during the season, you get a bag of veggies delivered to you. So the person who did that was uh, Mark Wilson, and so I got to know my farmer, um, and then I started teaching uh, this course, Community Development, and uh, when he was coming to the house to, you know, drop off the veggies, we started talking about um, what I did at the university. And uh, anyway, he started telling me about an idea that him and a couple people had been talking about of developing a community garden um, in Rabbit Town. Um, so it kind of began with uh, him coming to this class and presenting um, the issues. And then we helped the class help to write the grant. And, you know, long story short, I became very involved and ended up becoming the director of a not-for-profit organization. So the first step is really defining the professional role. And I'm not really sure if a professional really consciously does this, but I think it is important um, to think about what your role is. And I personally feel that you don't have to choose one of these roles, four roles, but you could have, you know, you might be doing multiple ones. So one role of a professional is facilitative. So this is concerned with stimulating and supporting community development, really acting as a catalyst um, and helping the process along. So I certainly helped facilitate this, but the other people in the Rabbit Town Community Garden was obviously Mark Wilson, the farmer, who was also interested in um, food security issues. Uh, he was a catalyst. Um, and also there was another community leader, uh, Derek, I forget his last name right now. He um, was also involved, and he was kind of someone that was just generally a community leader of um, social action, specifically involving people who are low income. People can also take an educational role. So that's a, a more agenda setting role. So having positive and direct input. And this is really related to like knowledge and skills and expertise. So uh, for example, you know, what I brought um, to the Rabbit Town Community Garden is obviously um, could kind of help to organize what the agenda should be, what the goal should be, understand the community development process. So have, you know, certain knowledge, skills and expertise that I can provide. Uh, also, just because of my own, you know, um, leisure activities, I'm a you know, my family, we're pretty good uh, veggie gardeners. We're known for that. So even having, you know, I have the experience and skills related to the leisure activity, to the knowledge of how to grow vegetables. Although I had to learn how to grow vegetables uh, again um, in St. John's because it's a, a different climate. 
You can also have a representational role. So that's interacting with external bodies on behalf of or for the benefit of the community. For example, with the Rabbitown Community Garden, I represented the community when it came to talking with the director at the Rabbitown Community Center. I also was the representative to speak to who owned the land we were going to put the garden on, which ended up being the Newfoundland Labrador, you know, housing. So um, I had to, you know, speak with them because uh, they're the landowners. Also, um, represent uh, speaking with the uh, board at the Rabbitown community. So, uh, and as well as different government leaders that I had to speak with. For example, the, um, you know, the member, um, the community ward representative for that area. And then also a professional can have different technical skills. And this is obviously just applying certain skills to the process. And it's really about skill sharing. Um, you know, a lot of people have so many great skills, but a lot of the time the reason community development projects don't work or aren't really initiated is just about some skills. And that could be, for example, um, in this case, that community really had no experience writing grants. Well, being an academic, I do have a lot of experience. So I was able to provide that technical skill as well as just like organizing skills, how to run meetings, take minutes, um, you know, figuring out all the policies and procedures when it came to um, operating a community garden and also a not-for-profit. So this is the uh, diagram from Brown and Harris that really shows these four different uh, roles. So educational, facilitative, representational, and technical. And as I said, from the very beginning of a project, you might be in, it might be very clear which role you're in. Um, for example, if you are advocating on behalf of a certain group of people with disabilities, let's say people with autism, well, you're more of in an educational role because you're really focusing on consciousness raising, training people, you know, how to uh, be accommodating to people with autism, how to design programs that um, meet their needs and the environment, for example. Or uh, you might just be brought in as technical. For example, I have done a lot of community development work, which my entire role is really to help them figure out the project and how to write a grant. So it's really more kind of of an academic role where I'll, I mean, I'm just helping to organize them and give them the skills that they need. You might be a representational where you're really just, you know, um, social advocating, let's say via media or that sort of thing. And finally, facilitative is more like hands-on where you're working with people, um, providing them with support and facilitation. The second step, which is very important, is to research the community. Um, I often feel that most people ignore this step, and it's, it's very important. Why do we have to gather information about our community? Well, we have a responsibility. We need to have some context for what is going on. No community is the same. No neighborhood is the same. No group of people are the same. We cannot make assumptions. It is our responsibility to collect the information in order to make informed decisions that are best for that community. It also provides you credibility to understand, you know, and let's give a general example, me moving to Newfoundland, I'm going to admit I had very little knowledge of Newfoundland or the history of Newfoundland. You know, it's not something that is fully discussed even, you know, in Canadian history when I was a kid. So understanding the history of Newfoundland, the key stakeholders, knowing things that happened, it gave me credibility when I was working with community organizations. You know, that I'm here, I understand you. I'm, yes, I might have just moved in, you know, moved here a couple years ago, but I'm here to stay and make this a part of my life. And so I want to know your stories. It also gives you versatility. If you know who the case, key stakeholders are, it gives you flexibility of who you approach and how you work. For example, with the community garden, I very, I very soon 
um, identified, you know, there was one individual in um, Rabbit Town. He was the um, president of the Rabbit Town Tenants Association, therefore on the board for the um, for the Rabbit Town Community Center, and he lived in the community himself. Um, and he was very much looked up to in that community. He had all the information. He knew everything that was going on. So it was very important for me to meet with, his name was Matt, to meet with him um, and understand you know, what was going on. There was also then another person I had to talk to was you know, the executive director of, of the um, community center. Rabbit Town Community Center. And then also, I also identified other people who were just people who were interested in gardening and coming, but they were wanted to be involved. And I could tell that they were important people then for me to understand and who they were connected to in that community. And finally, the reason, another reason for researching the community is accountability. It, gives, it allows you to know what people want in the community and makes you responsible to help make it happen. You know, um, it's really hard to look someone in the face that you know and tell them that you're not going to be able to get something done that they that would help their quality of life. Uh, it's pretty easy to do that, though, when you don't know the people in the community. And that's really about, um, you know, you can be a external professional, an outsider, but still be fully immersed in that community and respect and value and have good relationships with the people that you are working for and on behalf of. When you're researching the community, obviously speak to people. Um, but other things is look at statistics. There's lots of um, socioeconomic and health information, and this is can give you lots of information about, you know, what are important needs in your community. For example, maybe you notice um, that there's a, a lot of people um, with, you know, certain health issues, or it's a, a low-income community, or there's a lot of older adults, or there's a lot of single people. You can figure a lot of this out when you're looking at statistics. And I want to point out specifically community accounts. Community Accounts is a very, very cool um, online statistics uh, website that is specific to Newfoundland. Newfoundland is not always known for our awesome online resources and stuff, but I mean, this is very cool and actually was developed um, by our uh, basketball coach. He's actually a statistician, um, or a, a male basketball coach, uh, Peter Benoit, and he helped to develop this. And what it does is it take it took uh, statistics from all different Stats Canada sources, but made it specific to Newfoundland. So for example, you can even go right down to your neighborhood level. So, you know, when I was, um, you know, I, I, the first time I used this, I was living on Larch Place. I was able to look at the statistics of my street you know I could see that whoa wow I was like one of the youngest people at the time when I first moved there there was a lot of older adults but that changed you know so you can um see how communities change but this is also excellent information to provide when you're writing grants justifying why you need funding you know to be able to do a specific project Researching the community also involves personal involvement in the community. Get involved and actually speak to people. So for example, with the community, uh, with the Rabbit Town Community Garden, I attended weekly events. I went to their um, annual general meeting. I went to their Halloween party. I went and got to know people. And, you know, to this day, I know those people by name and, you know, can say hi to them. So it's about getting to know people and their concerns and what they also like about what's going on. You can also look at the newspapers and um, newsletters, radio. So for example, Rabbit Town um, Community Center has a monthly newsletter. So I read all of those. I went back and you know read the last five years of those newsletters to know what was going on. I spoke to key stakeholders, different agencies and organizations. I looked up... Um, you know, newspaper articles about Rabbit Town, learning about things to understand the history. The third step is entering the community. And uh, usually we present this as a dichotomous thing, like you can be internal or external. 
Uh, internal is when the professional lives in the community and is identified as part of that community. Whereas external um, is someone who it comes from elsewhere, is a stranger, and is often seen as an outsider. Now, quite often, if you're, you know, if, if you're being paid to do a, a particular job and you are a community, you know, doing community development in your profession, um, you're kind of an external already. Uh, you know, you're um, maybe not actually living in that community. But personally, I think that you can be an external um, professional, but that there's many, many ways for you to enter that community and integrate with them so that you are more viewed as internal. Um, for example, certainly, you know, um, Rabbit Town. I'm obviously, um, you know, I have a lot more education than most of the people who live in Rabbit Town. Um, you know, I'm, I have high income. I am not really someone who would, I mean, definitely like on paper, I'm certainly external to the people of Rabbit Town. However, I never felt that way and I never approached that because I approached it with respect. And therefore, the more I participated in that community, the more I became internal. And, you know, there was many of those people who were very good friends, you know, who, you know, I, I never would have met. And uh, for example, you know, I when my um, when I had a baby shower, many people from Rabbit Town were in, invited um, as they were my friends. So obviously, I feel like I was, was able to establish an internal viewpoint, even though I was external. Um, but this is obviously even in therapeutic recreation, this helps. For example, as a person with chronic pain, I'm never viewed as an external person when I'm working with chronic pain uh, populations because I have chronic pain myself. So I obviously have an insider perspective. And the more insider perspective you have, I think the more successful your community development work will be. Step four is consciousness raising. So that's like um, raising the level of consciousness about an issue to allow people the opportunity to explore that situation. And it's also examining the oppressive structures and discourses that frame their lives in such a way that they can act to bring about change. So, for example, with Rabbit Town, there was consciousness raising. For example, we brought up the history that, um, you know, Newfoundland used to grow 90% of its own produce, fed itself. But we, um, as, you know, after especially like big box stores have come, you know, around the 70s, 80s, this really switched. Um, and now Newfoundland um, imports 90% of our food. During Hurricane Igor, we realized that we only have, you know, five days supply of food to actually feed the island. Therefore, it's really important for us to be sustainable and, you know, grow our own food. And obviously, this is also important for people who are low income in order for them to have access to healthy food. So that's really the consciousness raising that we did then when it came to um, the community garden. Um, I, I wasn't really pointing out things like, hey, community garden is great for sense of belonging. It's great for health. I didn't really focus on that, focusing on very important issues that were very real to these people. And, you know, showing them that, hey, you have a plot of land that right now is just being used as a dumping ground and oil and tires. But we could create this into a beautiful community gathering space that also provides nutritious and free food. So we have to think then about the approaches that people use then to raise the consciousness of issues. Environmental, social justice, power, social in inequity within a community. And obviously ways we do this are education, media. You know, um, Newfoundland is awesome for media. Like you can get on the news in two seconds or on the radio. I've been on the news more, you know, Having lived in Newfoundland, I actually, I, I got asked to be on the news um, during my job interview. That's how easy it is. So, you know, you can just put in ads to, for things. So, for example, the community garden, we were featured in the scope, which was like a, one of the free community reg, you know, independent uh, magazines. They used to have that and then um, was outcast, which now just 
close to, but um, we were uh, also on TV. It was called Living NL, and we were featured um, in two, um, on, on two television episodes. Now, these are just examples, but obviously that built consciousness. It's also about building visions and confidence and, you know, self-help groups. Step five is needs and assets assessment. And this is in a way closely connected to getting to know your community. But I want to emphasize that unless you know your community, you're not going to really know what the needs and assets are. So that's why it's earlier on in the steps. So community needs assessment is figuring out the opinions, assumptions, needs, issues, and assets. So assets are like what's good within a community. So this helps you then to identify the needs, concerns, and issues. For example, um, in the Rabbit Town Community Garden, you know, people were concerned that people were going to steal vegetables. People were concerned that there would be vandalism. People were concerned that um, it was going to be noisy, that, you know, there'd be all these teenagers hanging out or something like that. Um, it also allows you to target your outreach programs, like who is most vulnerable, for example, or where will you make the most change? And so then it allows you to empower grassroots action. And also, because you have a baseline, you can see if needs have changed or if they've improved. Um, and it's also about, it's not just about like numbers and paper, but it's about understanding a community's hopes, dreams, desires, their goals, and then you as a community development practitioner are helping to enable and facilitate those dreams. So how do we assess needs? Well, it's really just data collection. So, you know, you could do focus groups, you can have forums, Secondary data analysis, like I said, like looking at all those um, Stats Canada or community count sites. You could do a questionnaire. You can do interviews. You can do asset mapping. So that's like looking at what are the skills and buildings, infrastructure, all the different things that are positive in that community. For example, at the community garden, I quickly made sure I made a list of the skills of people. Like, oh, look, okay, that person, um, is very good at construction and they could build let's say raised beds hey this person over here has been um you know they have some accountancy practices so maybe they could help you know run the treasury for the garden um oh this person has experience like growing vegetables and has a you know biology background you just start finding all these different skills with people that helps you to you know get the project done And then is setting goals. So these are really broad directions for closing the gap, where you are now and where you want to be. And I'm not going to get into this too much because we talk about goals a lot in recreation and leisure and therapeutic rec. But why we want to set these goals is obviously if you have clear goals, then you're effectively communicating because you're telling the community, you know, these will be our goals. It also allows everyone to have a common vision and, and goals. When everyone's on board on the same thing, it's much easier to get projects done. It allows you to have a plan. It allows you to figure out if you have the right leadership. You know, I cannot be the all, you know, I was not able, I did not have the skills to do all of this, but as then the community development person, I'm able then to figure out who, which people can I bring in who do have the appropriate leadership. Um, it also allows you to have community and political support. Politicians don't want to support you unless they think you're actually going to be successful. So if you have a goal and a plan, it's going to make it look a lot better for them to, um, you know, endorse your project or whether that's helping to get you funding. Uh, in this case, for example, I had uh, tons of St. John's um, community uh, counselors, you know, who they were, you know, worked for the city, uh, but their real jobs were like, um, you know, being a developer, construction or real estate. So, you know, for example, um, uh, the one person, I just uh, phoned them on their cell phone, and next thing I knew, I had an excavator at the community garden site to help uh, dig up, um, you know, some, like, old tires and 
you know, dangerous stuff that had been in the in the soil. Um, it also helps you to make sure you have adequate information and resources that you actually have the t the what you need to get done, that you have the advice and assistance you need. It allows you also to be flexible and to compromise when you have goals. You know, like you're never actually. I don't think I've never been on any project where we actually set and did every single thing. You know, things change, plans change. It also allows you to have participation from a lot of different groups because maybe you can have goals that each different group identifies with. You know, in this case, some people wanted um, that uh, the land just be cleared and to look nicer. So, you know, the community beautification people were on board. Some people cared about healthy eating. So the nutrition people were on board, you know, and I can then put that all out as different goals. And finally, you can then have willingness to work with change and diversity. So this doesn't always happen, but sometimes you end up developing an organization to address an issue. And if that case, you then have to get organized. And this involves becoming a real not-for-profit. And, uh, you know, it's quite easy, actually, to get not-for-profit status. You pay, um, last I checked, it's $75 to the government of Newfoundland, for example. Uh, and you have to have a mission statement. You have to have an executive director, a secretary, and a treasurer. You have to have some policies, etc. cetera. Um, and also this way, then, you can develop external funding. For example, when the Rabbit Town Community Garden first started, we couldn't actually apply directly to grants because we weren't an, org, uh, an actual organization. So we went through um, the food security network um, at, the, at the time, um, and or Food First NL, it might be called now. And uh, so they were actually the people, you know, I wrote the grant, but they managed the grant. And then in order to be able to be more independent, we then looked into this and you know, we're able to um, get our own um, not-for-profit status and then able to apply for funding. Um, so I should have mentioned on the last slide, you might not have an actual organization, but you're at least going to have a project organization where you know who's doing what roles. And then you really need to make a plan. So where you, you now know, hopefully you know what the strengths, the weaknesses are, what resources, you know where you want to be because you have goals. So you have a general direction of where you want this project or the community to go. You should then have outlined the specific actions, the who, what, where, when, why, when, and how. The resources and capacity issues. You know, how are you actually going to do these specific goals? And also what success will look like. How will you tell when you've been successful? For example, at the community garden, we viewed success is that people came to the garden, that they started to become interested in vegetables. And most importantly to us was that the children in the community started to become interested in vegetable growing as well as healthy eating. So obviously there's different things that help with successful planning. As I've mentioned before, it's really good if you have a shared vision. Having good long-term commitment and leadership from the community is important. It's very difficult to get a, a project done if leadership is continually changing, etc. Making sure you have all the resources, that's finance, physical, and human. For example, one of the things that really was struggle for me at the community garden was that I was the only person with a car. So... Uh, and looking back on reflecting, that might have been the biggest struggle and also maybe the biggest reason why I ended up kind of stopping um, to volunteer there was just that, you know, I was always the one with the car, whether it was to get something from the store, to get the seeds, to get pick people up, whatever. So um, it was very intensive to me. And, you know, I understood that. I mean, that I I was the only one who perhaps had the income to own a vehicle, but it was a struggle. And looking back, I probably should have done more to just get people with vehicles to volunteer and that sort of thing. Um, it also helps, obviously, if you have, if you have community and political support, 
a realistic view of what's going on and make sure that you're a desire to build on the accomplishments and efforts of the past. Like it's really important to keep building on something and not to go into community to fix it. You're going in there to facilitate and to help, not to fix a problem. That's the individual view of, of blaming. It's also important that it's inclusive and that you work on a team. Um, I, you know, in my experience, when I didn't actually ask someone's opinion, I forgot to or was busy or something, and it would always come to bite me. Uh, make sure that you um, consult with everyone. Maybe you're not going to do what everyone asks, but make sure that you ask everyone's opinions. That's inclusive. Um, a strong commitment. Uh, and make, making sure you've got the discipline to take the time needed to work through all of this. And, you know, this takes time. It's a process. And uh, also making sure that you have a commitment to the plan, but you're also willing, you have to be able to modify and make adjustments as needed. So then you got to take action. So this is, you know, you got to implement the plan, be responsive and flexible, and also modify if needed. And, you know, it's funny if you actually look in this process, this, you know, look at all the steps. We've taken eight steps to actually get to action. It's only once you've fulfilled all of these planning and getting to know the community steps and understanding things, that's only when you finally do action. If you don't do steps one to eight and do them well, step nine is not going to happen. Or it might, but it's going to be a flop. And lastly is evaluation. So, you know, you have to really, what worked and why, what did not work and why, what would you do differently, what adjustments and changes. And this is really, um, you know, you can do this as a proper evaluation with, um, with you know, qualitative and quantitative information or whatever. Um, for example, at the community garden, we noticed that, you know, we had parents and grandparents telling us that their kids were eating vegetables all the time and wanted to try things when they went to the grocery store for the first time. Um, you know, when the kids feel proud that they were growing these things, so it made them want to eat more veggies. Um, but it's not just about those kind of, you know, even subjective things, but it's also thinking about leadership and how you could have done the process. And, you know, really the only way you learn in community development is to reflect. You have to be a very reflective practitioner. So those are basically kind of the process of community development. And obviously this keeps going on and on. And, you know, after you finish one project, you might be doing another one on that community. And so maybe the cycle just keeps kind of continuing. But uh, when you do um, look at community development, it's very important to look, make sure that you are touching on all of these uh, different steps. So that's, uh, again, the process of community development. And um, next we'll you know, after we talk about process, we're going to be looking more at community development models, as well as very specific strategies that you can use in the process of community development.